You can be seated. Ephesians, Ephesians, Ephesians. We'll be in chapter 1 and chapter 3. Now, over my years here, I have preached from these passages before. They will have a, a freshness to them this morning. And you know I don't ever bring you a canned sermon. I don't keep my sermon notes and go back, just pull them out of a file folder and sit up here and read them to you. I, I, I do not do that. But there are times when we need to revisit certain perspectives that the Word of God gives us. And I know that a, a lot of you are a little anxious. I know you're not anxiety-ridden, you know. That's kind of the opposite of being faithful, right? To be anxiety-ridden, just, just to like almost give up. What, what's the use? What do you mean, what's the use? We're ambassadors. God's got this. He knows what's going on, right? Amen? Amen. Amen. But to have a little anxiousness from time to time, that's a human experience. Some of us are anxiously awaiting some final election results, for example. <laughs> Some of us are anxious to know where this world is headed and our place in it and how we can fit and how we can continue to minister the gospel in a powerful and meaningful way. So there truly is a little bit of difference between the word anxious and anxiety. So I don't want to walk in anxiety, but in my anxiousness to see what's going to happen next... Sometimes I have to remind myself, just be patient and wait on the Lord. He knows what he's doing, Carl. I, I, you know, just as a part of my life, the career I had in law enforcement before coming here and being your pastor for decades and, and then a senior pastor, um, I'm a planner. <laughs> my staff can tell you usually we have a plan A, which is the go-to plan, but before we even start to implement that, we often discuss what plan B is. <laughs> and yes, I am OCD enough. We have a plan C as well. <laughs> Ask them, they'll tell you. <laughs> it's like it's called redundancy systems. See, some of you make fun of me because I do this. You do know every time you fly on an airliner, they have a plan A, a plan B, and a plan C, right? You know that, right? So why are you thankful for them and you make fun of me like that? <laughs> but anyway, you get it, you get it. So you know, so there's a little bit of anxiousness built into my life because of that, because of what I do and trying to make a plan A and a plan B and a plan C. But even all of that, all of that is just wrapped up in make your plans, use your brain, take the facts that you have, make your plans. But understand, all of those plans can come to naught because our lives are always and should always be based on just trust the Lord day by day in faith. Now, but that doesn't excuse us. See, some people will take that and say, well, I'm not going to plan anything. I'm just going to trust the Lord. Well, then the quick little illustration I give, I've done it a million times, and I just say, well, then quit grocery shopping, right? Just trust the Lord. It'll show up on your front doorstep. Don't worry about it. Well, no, we got to do Oh, you got to make plans? <laughs> you you got to go to the grocery store? You, how long do you shop for? A day, and then you go back the next day? Are they, no, you shop for weeks at the time? Really? Sometimes months? Really? Hmm. You're not very faithful, are you? No, 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 no. You understand there's a balance to all of this. So, yes, we make plans. We use our brains. We look at what's happening in the world. We analyze, you know. But the bottom line is we also have to have a huge measure of faith, understanding that God is in control. He's got this. He knows where he's going. There's always room for us to work, for us to pray to the, to the throne of God, to receive wisdom and understanding, to, to adjust our courses of action, to fit in with as God reveals more and more to us what he's doing. There's always room for that. There's always room for those situations when all of our human plans fail because there were things around the corner we just didn't know about in the human realm. But God knew. And so when we're in him, we're in his plan, he can speak his wisdom to us. That's what the book of James means in the very first chapter when it says, and if any among you lack wisdom, and I'm going to add these words from time to time. We lack wisdom all the time, but I mean from time to time we are like at a loss. And if any of you then lack wisdom from time to time, Ask of the Lord, inquire of the Lord, and he will reveal to you the path you need to take. Then it says, but 
do this with faith and do not be double-minded. You know what that means. That means don't say, okay, I'm going to trust you, Lord, but I... No, no. Or I'm going to trust you, but I'm going to live like the rest of the world lives because I don't want to make anybody mad out here. But then I'm going to trust you, and then I'm going to... That's double-mindedness. He says, no, you're my ambassador. You represent me. You represent my kingdom. Forget what the world thinks. Stand on my word. Walk through this world. No fear. Use courage, sound mind, and mix it all with the love of Jesus Christ. Right? So in the meantime, our theme all this year, we, we came up with this thing. We didn't come up with it. I mean, now we know. We, we believed it back then. Now we know the Lord gave us this theme, right? Way back this time last year, we, we displayed this theme. We declared this theme, Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things. In all, how many is all? Even bad things? Even tumultuous times? Even in times of great tribulation? In all things? All things? Even when Joseph went to prison? Even when the children of Israel were backed up against the Red Sea? Even when Daniel was thrown in the lion's den? Even when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown in the fiery furnace? In all things? God works everything eventually. I'm adding that word, but that's what it means together. Because see, in Joseph's life, it took years. But eventually, boom. Daniel spent a night in a lion's den. How'd you like be taken to the zoo and thrown in a lion's cage? I wouldn't want to have them put me in and then snatch me out with a rope in five seconds. I wouldn't want that. Five seconds, a lion can rip your arm off. But to spend the night? Eventually, in all things, eventually, God will show you something. He'll show the people around you something. And he'll work all things together for good. Eventually. But you've got to have faith. Don't be double-minded. Does that make sense? So that was the thing. All things work together for good for those who know him, for those who love him. Watch this. And are called according to his purpose. A lot of people get tripped up a little bit on that part of the verse. Like, well, according to his purpose, what does that make? Ah, now you're asking the question, what is God's purpose? I mean, if I know God's purpose, then I can know whether or not I'm a part of that, whether I'm called to that or not, right? So I need to know God's purpose. Well, what do we mean when we say, what is God's purpose? Well, we're asking, what's God up to? I mean, we know it all started in the Garden of Eden. We know the mess that was made then. And we could ask the philosophical, it's a biblical question too. Why did he even allow it to mess up? Why didn't, when it did mess up, why didn't he just go to Satan? Poof, you're gone. <laughs> A little smoke puff. Well, I don't have time to get into all of that right now here this morning. I've answered that in several of the books that I've written in great detail and gone into the scholarship of the ages and the word meanings and the whole story of the Bible, the whole account from Genesis to Revelation. But the bottom line is, he allowed all of that to happen and knew it was going to happen because it was working towards a purpose. He's got a grand design, folks. Nothing surprises him. The Garden of Eden didn't surprise him. Satan's rebellion didn't surprise him. Adam and Eve's failure didn't surprise him. None of them were created as robots or puppets on a string or some animal that works by, you know, just instincts alone. No, we were created in God's image. And so were the angels, by the way. And there, there are passages of Scripture that say that. And again, I've got all of this referenced and recorded in those books. But we were created in His image. The angelic realm and the human realm were unlike anything else He created. And think of all that He's created. Seven billion people on the planet right now. 25 to 35 million species of other life that we know of, and we're still discovering new species all the time. And they're not, they're not new, but they're new to us. The deepest depths of the ocean, the deepest, darkest parts of jungles that we haven't explored or that we're just now exploring, we're finding new life forms. And we're at the top on this physical realm. We're at the top. 
We're at the top of the chain. We basically control it all. Just like what Psalm 8, we sang it, we opened the worship service with it, declares, Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And what is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man, and that's the same way of saying that, that his descendants are children, that you even care for us. Yet you have made us just a little lower than the angels. Truth. And crowned us with glory and honor. And out of the mouths of our infants come praise for you. And this is done to destroy the works of your enemy, who is Satan. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. See, that's what we were singing a few moments ago. We were singing that back to him. Oh, he's got a purpose. He's got a plan. In the meantime, we get to live. And we get to choose because we're not an animal. We're not a robot. We're not a puppet that he's manipulating strengths. We get to choose. Satan manipulates us, uses us, throws us away after he lies to us. Jesus doesn't do any of that. He lets us just enjoy life, and in the midst of it, we get to choose. Darkness or light, Jesus said, I am the light. If you come to me, you will live, but it's your choice. And that's where we are, but it's all headed somewhere. So when we declare this, I'm convinced that in all things, and I'm going to add again the word eventually because you understand that perspective. In all Because sometimes right in the middle of something, it doesn't look very good. <laughs> but eventually, somehow, in the midst of it all, God will get glory. And the end of the book I've read, Revelation 21, and there's coming a day, no more pain, no more suffering, no more crying, no more death. All things will be made new. And God will dwell with his people his people with him like it was in the beginning. Amen. See, you can give the Lord a hand. So eventually, all things will work together for the good for those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. So let us start Ephesians chapter 1 and discover what the purpose of God is because it says it right here. Next time somebody tells you, well, we don't know the complete will of God. We don't know the purpose. Well, you know, we may not know every detail of what he's thinking. We don't know. Every, his thoughts are like the grains of sand. But he has revealed his will to us. He has revealed his purpose to us. And you will soon know whether you're a part of that or not and can claim this promise that we have been singing about and reciting and standing in all year long. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9. And God has made known to us the mystery of his will. What's the will of God? Well, we don't really know. No, what did we just read? He has made it known to us. It's only a mystery to those who don't believe. It's only a mystery who don't know God's word. It's only a mystery who reject him. It's only a mystery to those who mock him. But look at this. He has made known to us, that is believers, the mystery of his will. According to his good pleasure, that means he knows what he's doing. He's the one directing all of this. Which he purposed in Christ and who those who are called according to his purpose he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment. In other words, eventually, he's bringing it to a conclusion. Dash, that is, to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Jesus Christ. And I'm going to add these words because here's what it means just like it was in the beginning. All things in heaven. Now, I know 
I've, I, listen, I've written a lot about this. And again, I don't want to get bogged down in this. I've talked about it. I've said it over and over, but we have so many new folks joining us by live stream. We have so many guests among us from Sunday to Sunday. By the way, I hear the pouring rain. Don't you all love that sound? Don't you go to sleep. That makes me want to go to sleep. If I have to stay awake and listen to this, you got to stay awake and listen to this, all right? But it also means I can preach for four or five hours because, I mean, you, you don't want to walk. As long as it's raining, you don't want to walk out there, right? That's right. You say, well, i got a number. No, we've already burned all those. We put them, we've taken them out. You don't have an umbrella out there anymore. <laughs> all things work together for his good. Watch this. All things in heaven and all things on earth. Now, I'm building a case here, and I'm going to take you right through Ephesians. I'm going to show you something powerful, so you hang on, because it's going to relate to our day and to your life. But I'm just laying this foundation. Everything in heaven everything on earth. Now, when we think of heaven, and this is what I've written about, and I'm not going to get bogged down too deeply here. But when we think of heaven, often we think of it somewhere up there. That's not what the Bible says. The book of Hebrews speaks of a curtain being behind a curtain. It speaks of other, it speaks of dimensional realms. Science speaks and knows and understands of dimensional realms. The CERN Hadron Collider is all about the realms and the dimensions and how to go in and out of them. They don't know how, but they're looking to harness that power. They know there are different dimensions of reality. Quantum physics and quantum science has proven it, basically. That's why when Jesus told the thief on the cross, today, up there called heaven, it's way out there and we'll eventually reach the heaven. Now, the Bible says that the universe that God created is just one part of his creation. He exists outside of the universe, just like the computer. The computer designer and maker is outside. Everything that takes place in that computer is inside, but it's the intelligence of the programmer and the designer that makes it all work. God's not running around inside this universe going, I've got to fix this, I've got to fix that. Whoops, the moon's out of whack. I've got to do that. No, he's outside of it all. Where? The Bible speaks of through a veil. That's what the veil in the temple represents. The one that was torn from top to bottom when Jesus was crucified. Are you all with me? Just before that happened, one of the thieves turned to him and said, Lord, Adonai, remember me. When you come into your kingdom. And he said, I tell you the truth. Today, just a few seconds, you're going to leave that body you're in. You're going to walk through a veil and you will be with me in paradise. Amen. This day. The book of Hebrews tells us it's there. It's always been there. It has been there all along. Heck, the book of Genesis tells us when the Garden of Eden was shut off, it wasn't destroyed. It wasn't carried far away to some far planet. It says that the veil dropped and cherubim were assigned to guard the doors to that dimension. There are supernatural powers guarding, keeping CERN scientists from finding the portals to go in and out of the different dimensions. That's why Jesus spoke of himself as a portal. He said, I am the portal. I am the truth. I am the life. You see, he, didn't say, he said, I'm the way. That's what he, that's what he meant. He said, I'm the door. I'm the gate. The sheep come through me. I'm the good shepherd. I am the gate. I am the door. You want to get to, to the presence of it? You got to come through me. Are you following me? You just read Ephesians chapter 1. What's his purpose? What's his will? To bring everything, and instead of me going in heaven, I'm to bring everything in heaven and earth back together again. Split the veil. Rid it of all filth. All things made new. No more death. Why? Because the Garden of Eden didn't have death until they rebelled. No more pain. Garden of Eden didn't have pain until they rebelled. No more suffering. No more crying. There was nothing to cry about. It was just life. The creator and all of the knowledge that could have been theirs and what did Satan tempt Adam and Eve with? If you'll just do this, you can have the knowledge of the holy ones, the gods, the little g. 
Does all this make sense to you now? Now we get into the New Testament and here we are talking about it again. That's the purpose. All things work together for good for those who love him and, and who are called according to his purpose. If you're in Jesus Christ, you're called. <laughs> you're supposed to be a part of the purpose. And that purpose is not to just sit around and wait for God to bring everything together. The purpose is to be out here and be proactive. Jesus said it like this. You be the salt. You be the light. You make a difference. You change some things. Get people ready. Open the door to Jesus Christ for others. Be the Noah who's standing in the ark with the door open saying, y'all come on in here now. It's fixing to rain. <laughs> right? Yeah, but nobody came in Noah's day. Yeah, but that's on them. It wasn't on Noah. We're the lots and his wife standing in the doors of our homes looking at the world outside going, they've lost their minds. They've lost their ever-loving minds. These people don't know what a marriage is anymore. These people don't know what a gender is. They don't know what a little boy is or a little girl is. They don't know what a man or a woman is. They don't know. They don't know. But just before God brought the baseball bat, he sent angels to take Lot and his family out. Are you following? The pattern is all through the scriptures. Matthew 24, Jesus is talking about the very last days and how it will all come together. And by the way, a lot of the things he says there are now happening in our generation. We're the first generation. They're now happening. He says, but in those days, immediately after the tribulation of those days, in other words, there's a limit to what God's going to allow. But if there will be a point, and we don't know the day or the hour, when God says, that's enough. But that day is coming. He says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the Son of Man will call his angels from the four corners of the earth and they will gather his elect to be with him forever. You know what that is? That's God affecting his purpose in the last days, gathering everything in heaven and on earth together again to be with the Lord like it was in the days of the Garden of Eden and to rule and reign with him, the Bible says. That's an amazing thing to think about. Rule and reign what? Well, if I understand the scriptures correctly, there's going to be a kingdom on earth. We're going to rule and reign on earth? I don't mind telling you, there's some people I'd like to rule over. <laughs> well, I'm going to leave that to the Lord. We'll see. <laughs> I, I may just be scrubbing toilets, and that's fine. I'll do that too. I'd rather do that in glory than to be a king of some, some dominion on the face of this Satan-filled earth, amen? amen? Or what if? This is just a big what if. There are some allusions to it in the Old Testament, and I've written about it. I'm not going to get into them here. But there are some allusions to this possibility, and a lot of scholars have seen it, that when he affects his purpose, he may, because he can, he may start it all over again somewhere else in another dimension. And we will rule and reign with him. Isn't that amazing to think about? I mean, he's, he's already done that at least once we know of. That is, when this dimension was created, the Bible says that the angels were there. That was another dimension of, of beings that were created in his image. They could think. They could choose. They could rebel if they wanted. Some of them did. But the angels were there when he created this realm, and they sang for joy. I heard a preacher say the other day, you know, there's nowhere in the Bible that talks about angels singing. They sang for joy, the book of Job says, at the work of his hands. We've got a song we sing for that. We sing for joy at the work of your hands. We're, we're just singing scripture in this place all the time. And there's some scriptures in the Old Testament that seem to allude to the fact that that's exactly what he's going to do, and we're going to be a part of that dimension that sings for joy as we watch him do it again. And then he takes Carl Gallops and says, you're the king of this area. <laughs> Y'all like that? 
I know some of you all saying, please, Lord, don't let me live in that kingdom. Please, <laughs> please, this guy's an idiot. Yeah, but my mind, I'll be made new then. I won't be an idiot anymore. Right? I mean, who knows? That's what the apostle Paul said when he got a glimpse of it. He was taken through that veil. He said, I was caught into this, up to this paradise, this third heaven, this dimension. I don't know if I was in the body or out of the body, he said. And what he meant by that was he was flesh and blood. He knew he, knew he wasn't a little ghost floating around. That's why he said, I couldn't figure out because I've got a real body. I'm really me. I saw my face in the crystal sea. It was me. <laughs> But I also know that my earthly body cannot inherit the things of God, just like a fish can't live out of the water in, all in, our, in our dimension, but they're flesh and we're flesh, but it's got to be a different kind of flesh. That's why Paul said, I don't, know, I don't know how that was pulled off, but I know I, Paul, was there. And he says, I'm telling you, your mind has never conceived. Your eye has never seen. Your ear has never heard what I heard. You can't even imagine it. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9. Oh, but God has revealed the mystery of his will to those of us that love him. He has told us what his purpose is. He has purposed to do this. He's done all of this on purpose. He allows us to be tested on purpose. He allows us and called us to be raised up in this generation of impending darkness he allowed us on purpose to be here with a purpose, on purpose, for a purpose. And you're a part of that purpose if you are born again, if you are under the blood, if you belong to him, if you're unashamed of the name of Jesus. And all these ifs go together into one thing, if you're born again. But I'm just saying, if you're not born again, then you will be ashamed and afraid. And if you're not born again, then, and I'm saying this to the world, I know most of you are here because you are born again, but I don't want to presume upon anybody. I didn't just pronounce salvation on anybody. I'm just saying I know a lot of you have given good faith and good testimony, and I don't get to judge your salvation, but I'm watching you live, and, you know, you seem to be living with purpose and with commitment and with realness in your life. The Lord will work that out with you. But if you're born again, then being a part of God's family has meaning to you. If you're born again, eventually somewhere in there you'll learn and understand that being a part of tithing and giving and investing yourself will have meaning to you. If you're born again, somewhere in there you'll begin to understand I need to be serving somehow. I need to be using my gifts, my, my anointing, my talents, my, my desires. I need, need to bring them to fruition somewhere in, somewhere in there. I'm not judging anybody. I'm just saying I know the Bible says all of this. If we're born again. And if you're born again, then you have been called to God's purpose. And his purpose is he's bringing everything eventually, everything in heaven and everything on earth together again as one family to rule and reign over everything that's been made new. And then if he wants to do it again, a thousand times again, we will rule and reign with him. Give the Lord a hand of praise. Isn't that amazing? So I'm not just trying to put lipstick on a pig. <laughs> Still looks like a pig to me <laughs> with lipstick on it. That's the whole point of that little saying. I'm not just trying to put lipstick on a pig. These are biblical promises. This is perspective of what it's all about. Otherwise, we could get all anxiety-ridden. We could just we could look at all this junk going. It's not just happening in the United States. This stuff's happening all over the world. I brought some articles here. Let me paraphrase them so we can um, let out of here a little early. Instead of being here four hours, we'll only be here two. So just hang on. Billy Graham. I've got every article up here in print. I'm not going to stand up here and read to you this morning. Just, just take my word for it, and I can give you the, the websites and everything. But Billy Graham, excuse me, Franklin Graham, his son, just uh, about a week ago, he was speaking of what's happening in the United States specifically. Persecution of Christians all around the globe, it is at an all-time high. Open Doors USA, they record this. There are other groups that do this too. 
and they track it. They've been tracking it for decades. It is at an all-time high. Now, there are some hot spots. It used to be North Korea was the number one hot spot. You know what the number one hot spot in the world is? China. China. China is horrifically persecuting Christians, closing churches, bulldozing them, ripping down, I mean, hunting down the underground church. You know, this is where Zev and Lynn, Lynn's got a whole family that lives there. This is where Zev and Lynn minister. We are known. Our name is known. Hickory Hammock is known and celebrated in a, in a good biblical way in hundreds of underground churches because of the ministry of Zev, the book that he and I wrote together. They took it there. Revivals have broken out there. They, they know us. They pray for us. That's amazing, isn't it? They can't watch by live stream. But they pray for us and they call us by name because of Zev and Lynn's connection there and Zev and Lynn's connection to us and the ministries that Zev and I have done in TV and radio and book writing and all of that because you've allowed me and him and you've... It's just crazy how all of this is working. It's surreal for me to even... I'm talking about it, telling you, and I'm sitting here thinking, am I lying about this? It sounds like a lie to me. It's so surreal. But it's happening. And in that land, that is so connected to this election and this nation and many of our leaders, the number one persecutors of the church on the planet. I'm glad we don't have any persecution of the church in America, aren't you? Wonder where they're getting their ideas from. Masking everybody up, putting everybody in quarantine, shutting the churches, the bars, the big box stores, the casinos, they can be open. But we, you know, we, we, we have set ourselves up on the throne, proclaiming ourselves to be God. We've set ourselves up in the temple of God, which Paul says is the church, is the church, is the church. Don't you know you're the temple? Don't you know the church is the temple? Don't you know you are the temple? Jesus is the temple, but now you're the physical representation of him. He is the temple of God. You now are the living temple on the face of the earth. And the Bible says, and that spirit, that antichrist, that God-hating I will exalt myself to the throne of God. The Bible says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and he will set himself up in God's temple in the last days and say, I am God over all of you now. And now governments of the world are looking at the church saying, go home, shut your doors, or we'll put you in jail, or we'll bulldoze your church down. And if you do go back, it's only because we'll let you go back. And if we let you go back, we'll tell you how many people can be there. And we'll tell you how you can breathe or not. And we'll tell you how far you have to sit from each other. You can't touch each other. You can't get in each other's faces and hug each other and pray together and minister together. You can't do that. We'll tell you. And don't you sing songs to Jesus. Either. Don't you be singing because you're going to kill us all if you go in those buildings and sing. Now you can get all liquored up and gather around a table in a casino among, th among thousands of people and gamble all day long. That's okay because the, the plague can't touch you there. You can gather by the tens of thousands in the streets and burn cities down and shoot at cops. That's okay. The plague won't touch you there. Matter of fact, it seems like it's even healthier to do that. I've read these articles to you where they literally say these words. I'm kind of flowering them up a little bit, but that's, that's that spirit that says to the church, You shut up and you do what I say and you listen to me. And we're watching it just kind of flood in, even in the United States. And now the nation that we're so connected to in so many evil ways is now the number one persecutors of the church on the planet. I don't think there's any coincidence to these ties. And that spirit is sweeping the planet, guys. And a lot of what happens in America is tied to this election and the eventual outcome. But God already knows. See, some people say, well, Carl, what's going to happen? I don't know, but God does. He knows. And I'm going to serve him. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And, and, and he knows. And he knows what he's doing. You can give the Lord a hand of praise. You can do that. And, and he knows what he's doing. But in the meantime, Franklin Graham, he, he spoke about this, and, and I'm just paraphrasing his words, but he said, look, it's, it's, it's atrocious what's happening. It's an all-time high. And he says, and I'm telling you, he said this. I'm, I'm paraphrasing his words, but I promise you this is his message. He says, and largely it's the church's fault. 
and we haven't been the salt and the light. We've played games with a lot of it. Now, he's not using these words, but I promise you that's what he said. It's, it's our fault. And I've read to you the scripture over and over in the New Testament. And judgment begins with the house of the Lord. See, judgment is coming to this wicked world. It is. I mean, that's just the fault of Satan, Adam, Eve, the human condition, the arrogance of our lost souls. That judgment is it's coming. There's just there's no way around it now. But the Bible says, but there's a separating process. There's a judgment that first comes to the house of God just before the return of the Lord. The whole world has never seen something like we're living in right now. Where all over the world there's a spirit of shut the church, shut the church, shut the church, shut the mouths of the preachers, shut the, shut the gospel, shut the church. We're in control. We are the gods of the church. Now we tell you what to do and when to do it and how to do it and if you can do it and how many of you can do it and how you breathe and how you live and how you talk, talk to each other. We control that under penalty of law. Because we're trying to bring peace and safety to the world. And the Bible also says in those days when they are crying out peace and safety, sudden destruction comes. The wrath of God falls. God's people are taken out of the way, but the wrath comes during the days when they are saying, we're doing this for your peace and for everybody's safety. You reckon we might be close to that? Well, it's right up to the edge anyway, right? purpose of God. God has not hidden from us the mystery of his will. The only reason it's called a mystery, I've already told you, is because if you don't have the Holy Spirit, if you're not in the Word, if you're not connecting the biblical dots in context like we're doing this morning and like we've done for years together, the whole thing's a mystery. People laugh and mock at you and me because our cars are out there and we're in here worshiping today. They've got better things to do. We're a bunch of idiots. You know that, right? It's all a mystery to them. You're a mystery to them. If you're a mystery to them, you know Jesus Christ and the purpose of God is a mystery to them, right? But the Bible says, but God has not hidden the mystery of his will from us. He has made known to us his purpose. Because you've been called according to his purpose. What is his purpose? Dash. <laughs> that is bringing everything in heaven and on earth back together again. You know, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, several different places, again, I've got them all cataloged and recorded. I've done word studies and got scholars that attest to what I'm getting ready to tell you is true. In the Old Testament and the New Testament, it says, and on that day, what we see as the sky it will roll up like a scroll and the stars will appear to just fall. You know what's happening? Something's being peeled back. And the book of Revelation says, and on that day, they beheld the face of God and the kings of the earth went and hid themselves in the mountains and in holes in the grounds because when that sky peeled back and everything fell, it looked like, and there was the face of God who had entered the dimension that he had created, they said, who will save us from the wrath of God and of his lamb? Who will save us? The answer is no one. Like the ark, when the rain started, the Bible says in three different places in Genesis, and God shut the door. Noah didn't tell his sons, go shut the door, boys. I, I, I heard a few drops splatter. At God's timing, he shut the door. The whole time the door was open, anybody that Noah had preached to could have gotten on board. But it was all a mystery to them. Noah was a nut. He was a prepper. He was one of those conspiracy theorists. He wasn't getting with the new age of the day. We got peace and safety coming. We got leaders rising up that are just going to, they're going, what are you building a boat for, a ship, an aircraft carrier? 
What are you building that in your backyard for? Because God's wrath is coming. And on that day, the door was shut. On the day, fire fell on Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot and his family were already gone. The angels had taken them. And when that fire fell, there was no escaping it. It was done. That day is coming upon the world. I don't have a clue when. We don't set dates here. I don't even try to guess a particular age or time. I just know I see the Bible unfolding before us. I see it all unraveling. And it's time, that again, that we take a moment and we have a little bit of perspective. We've been saying this, proclaiming it, and singing it all year long. I'm convinced that eventually, in all things, God's going to work everything together for good. And that's not just a, oh, everything will be okay, don't worry, be happy. No, there's a lot of times we're not happy in this falling world, fallen and falling world. But all things will work together for good. If you love him, just love him, faith him. For those that love him, watch this, and who are called under the blood according to his purpose that he's working. Ephesians 1, and we know what his purpose is. The mystery of his will. It's to bring everything in heaven and on earth back together again under the head of Jesus Christ. And the book of Revelation ends by saying, and on that day, we will be a kingdom of priests and rulers, and we will rule and reign with him. So in the meantime, folks, with this perspective, we go forward. Oh, I know that the United States is sitting in some anxiousness. Some are pure anxiety-ridden. In a few weeks, we'll know. We'll see where the chips fall. I preached last week. I, I truly believe prophetically it's one of two things. Prophetically. Otherwise, you could say, well, sure, he's going to lose or he's going to win. No, I, I don't mean that. I mean, we're either backed up against the Red Sea and God's getting ready to do a miracle before us so that he gets all the glory. I know a lot of us say, that's what I'm praying for. I think, me too, me too. But remember when they crossed the Red Sea and they went into the desert, they still had 40 years of toughness. Okay? We live in a fallen world. Either he's going to part the Red Sea, we're going to get a little breathing room, we're going to keep going doing what we're doing, knowing that there will still be trials and tribulations, wars and rumors of wars, and persecution. Or he will not part the Red Sea. And it'll all start happening very quickly. Oh, it'll start flowery, peace and safety and security. We've got a new world we're going to bring to you. We're going to change things, new norm. Everything's lovely, just follow us. Could be that day is right around the corner. I don't want that. Doesn't matter what you want. God's working his purpose. He knows where you are. He doesn't just love you. He is in love with you. There's a lot of you in here. I can say, I love you, I love you, I love you. I mean that with my life. But there's one young lady in here that I'm in love with. You know, and that's my wife. Okay, some of you say, say it. Say my name. She's over there saying, say my name. Say my name. <laughs> you better be talking about me. Yeah, she knows. I'm in love with her. So does God love his creation? Seven billion people. Does his heart break with love? For God so loved the world. But when you are born again, the Bible says you are in Jesus Christ and he is in the Father and you are in them and he is in you. You're in his love. He is in love with you. He knows where you are. And he has promised all things work together for good if you love him back and if you're called according to his purpose. At the end of all of this, you won't regret a moment. He'll make everything new. He'll make everything right that this world has stolen from you and trashed you with. He will make it right. How do I know that? First of all, the Bible says it. Secondly, because there's no more crying. There's no more mourning. There's no more pain. Everything is made new. And you say, oh my gosh, I get it now. He had it in the palm of his hands all along. So here we are today, though. We're on this side of the veil, on purpose, for a purpose, with a purpose, working towards a purpose. Let us be faithful 
to the purpose. Let us be faithful to the goal. Let us be faithful to God's plan because I'm convinced that all things are going to work together for you, for me, for those of us that know and love the Lord, regardless of what happens in this world around us, for those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. Give the Lord Jesus a big old hand of praise. Now, unless, and I, and I don't think so because the Lord's put this on my heart, we'll come back to Ephesians next week. We'll continue this message into another section of Ephesians that ties with this that makes some astounding, deeper declarations about everything I've just said. I know what y'all are going to say. Come, go read Ephesians. Good. My trick worked. <laughs> Please read the Bible. Please. See if you can find it. But for now, we'll close with that. We know what His will is. We know what His purpose is. And if we're in Jesus Christ, we know that we are a part of it and He knows us and He hasn't forgotten us and He knows who we are and where we are. And so let's just be in Him because He is in love with you, His children. Bow your heads with me.